Okay, I'm going to try to complete this uh, discussion here in this uh, next 10 minutes. Um, so we've talked about postmodern, we've talked about deconstructionist, and now we're going to talk about the window, which is really just an example of an opportunity for an opportunity. You know, windows of opportunity are those places, are those periods of time again when you have a chance of doing something. You know, when you're... Um, you know, as you go through your life, there's times when you have this opportunity, like, you know, you're going to be a professional basketball player. Well, you know, that window of opportunity is open for maybe eight or ten years. And and when you hit 30 and you're not a professional basketball player, your window of opportunity to being a professional basketball player is pretty much closed. So <clears throat> what Dennis Martinez is talking about here is we've got this uh, window here, this opportunity to to do something. And that something is based in the next term, which is cultural relativity. And cultural relativity is um, this idea that came about partially because of the postmodern world that we're in. In fact, that's perhaps totally within the postmodern world that we're in. That uh, essentially, the uh, culture, each culture is valid. And this is something that's really, really radical uh, when you consider the whole history of Western philosophy, the idea that non-Western cultures might actually be um, uh, valid expressions, human expressions of spirit. Uh, when we look at um, and look at the turn of the uh, 20th century, you know, there's this whole big thing of what we call social uh, um, um, you know, this, um, I forgot the term I was just going to use, but um, when we look at the idea of evolution, cultural evolution and social evolution, there is this idea that everybody in the world is moving to where the West is because, and because the West is so superior. Well, during that time, uh, you remember what happened to Native people around the world during that time, and especially in North America. During the 17, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s, uh, Indian people uh, were being stripped of their cultures, a period that we call the assimilation period, when everybody sent off to school and not allowed to teach to, to learn their language and separated from their own people. And uh, Henry Pratt, who used to run the, uh, who's the guy who, who established the Carlisle boarding school, talked about saving the man and killing the Indian. Well, Obviously, that's not going to be uh, a period of cultural relativity where you look at the value of different cultures. In that particular time, during that period where the West assumed that they were the pinnacle of human expression, there was this very, very strong feeling that everybody had to be like the West. Well, that pretty much that theory kind of hung on. Uh, and there was a lot of people who were not in the West, people like Mahatma Gandhi and some other folks who fought that idea. So that when the postmodernist period came around, people like Gandhi would be able to stand up and say, well, we have our own values. We have our own way of defining justice. We have our own way of defining our relationship to the land. And we don't have to follow the Western value system. And so this idea of cultural relativity, meaning that on a relative basis, all cultures are essentially equal. And so during this particular time that we're at, and what uh, Dennis Martinez is talking about here, is that we have a, a window, a point of opportunity, where because of people's attitudes about culture and the relative uh, relationship between cultures, that no one culture is automatically better than the other, that we have the opportunity to begin to seriously contemplate the importance of indigenous knowledge in the world. And then the next step then is to move into how do we apply this indigenous knowledge. And that's really what this chapter is all about. As we start looking at especially in terms of the environment and human relationships to the place and land, we begin to see, um, whether it's the Pueblo of Isleta or whether it's, uh, um, it's John Mohawk talking generally about uh, Native people and the land, we find that there is this relationship between the land and the people, and that the people form the land and the land forms the people. The land forms the language, the land forms the livelihood. And... Um, 
human beings uh, may be able to do things to impact the land, but ultimately the land is uh, have a far more powerful impact on people and cultures than people have on the land. Of course, uh, you know we we've we we're in a situation now in this in this in this particular point in time in the early part of the 21st century where our ability to manipulate landforms and build dams and take down mountains is is kind of changing that relationship to land in the sense that we are forming the land to us as opposed to listening to it and, and learning from it what we're supposed to learn. But, but by and large, um, uh, the land still uh, determines who we are. Um, you know, Indian tribes, uh, various tribes throughout the throughout the uh, world, uh, not just natives in North America, but throughout the world, manipulated their environment. And one of the things in the uh, in that article, Dennis Martinez talks a lot. I mean, a lot about burning. I, I, sometimes I think the guy's a pyromaniac, but. He spends a lot of time talking about burning, and I've talked with him a lot, and uh, he's very, very strong in terms of this is the way that pre-contact Native people managed the land was primarily through burning, and he gives examples of of burning in the Northwest Coast specifically for the purpose of creating an environment conducive to those plants that they make uh, baskets out of. But we also see the same thing is true uh, throughout uh, North America. In the book 1491, there was a lot of discussion about land use, uh, land use uh, management practices by Native people prior to the coming of uh, the Europeans. And what were the goals of those management practices? And you know, how do you do those management practices cause, you know, within a tribal situation? Because you have, when you look at the way that, say, North America is laid out, there's areas of exclusive use where a tribe uses the land and no other tribe uses it. But there's huge, huge amounts of land that's used by many different tribes. You know, for example, you know, we look down here at Sandia Mountain and there's, uh, there's you know, it belongs to Sandia. That's their land. But almost every tribe, every Pueblo tribe has a shrine there and they visit those shrines to clean them and to renew them every so often, depending on their uh, ceremonial calendar. And so that that's an area of joint use. And so in areas of joint use, how do you manage the land so that everybody is able to have their meet, needs met? And of course, that involves communications and agreements and all kinds of respect and things of this sort. But that's part of that relationship, relationship with the land and relationship with the other people who use that land as well as our own um, our own tribal needs for for whatever that land provides. So anyway, that's what this postmodern deconstructionist window of cultural relativity means, is we suddenly have, simply because of the philosophical background, the philosophical makeup of this particular time and the history of humans and human beings, and particularly the history of Western civilization, we have the opportunity to influence uh, the direction, even though we're not Western. <laughs>